Hello, and welcome to the RollWise podcast, where friends discuss tabletop role-playing games and news of the industry, even though we're not a news show. I'm joined by my two friends, Brent and Jeff, and uh, we have quite the show for you today. Uh, Brent, how are you doing today? I'm well. How's it going? It's going good. And Jeff, how about yourself? I'm doing pretty good as well. Good. Uh, so today, uh, we have two topics that we're really going to dive into. Uh, we're going to talk about the tale of many play tests. Uh, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about solo role playing. Um, uh, just because I think that, uh, those two topics actually bring some good synergies because as you all know, nobody has all that time to be playing all these games, especially with friends. But before we do that, uh, Jeff, do you want to let everybody know about our socials and stuff? If you want to get a hold of us, you can find us on Twitter at RollWise, R-O-L-E-W-I-S-E. It's the same name on YouTube. And if you'd like to get a hold of us by email, it's RollWiseGuys at gmail.com. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And of course, uh, you know, if you happen to be listening to this podcast on YouTube, uh, please like, subscribe, comment. Uh, let us know what you like about this. Let us know what you'd like to see. And of course, uh, don't be afraid to let us know why you didn't like the episode. Uh, we're not afraid of, of feedback. Um, so as we dive into the tale of many play tests, uh, I thought it was interesting because last week we had talked about Cobalt Press, their Black Flag project, um, their first play test packet and everything like that. Uh, but since then, uh, they actually responded to feedback and some critiques in their own design diary. And because they used the number one at the end of the title, I assume it's going to be an ongoing kind of community dialogue uh, that I feel is really important for these kind of things. Um, in addition, we saw that D&D &D has resumed one D&D playtest after the uh, giant dumpster fire that had been happening between December and January. Uh, so while uh, Kyle Brink, I think that is his name, the executive producer, goes around apologizing on every major D&D role-playing podcast, uh, the actual game designers uh, are putting together more content. They're letting you guys know what they feel about their feedback, and we have some interesting updates there. And because uh, we are not a news podcast that happens to be as timely as some news channels, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Matt Colville and his uh, upcoming project and how he seems to be taking a different stance than everybody else. So uh, with that in mind, we have a trio of choices. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Project Black Flag and Cobalt Press? What do you guys think? You guys had a chance to read through that design diary? I thought the, I thought the design diary was great. Um. I actually think I made the comment to you guys that I thought they should have put it out <laughs> with the release last week um, because it, it, it explained a lot of the why and what they're trying to do and why they're trying to do it. And I think as a consumer, I found a lot of value in that. Brent, what did you think? I think a big part, uh, I, I agree with you. I think they definitely should have probably put that out ahead of time um just because it gives you a kind of idea what their mission statement and their like philosophy is going to be i do think it's interesting that cobalt press has really taken on this we're making a 5.5 edition of of the game um in the hopes of like getting some of those people to stick um to the game when one dnd comes out i think that's an interesting decision on their part um because I think it's a, I think it's one of those things. You're just going to have a bunch of, you know, five E clones out there now, um, including one D and D itself. Because they said that we're not really moving away from, you know, five point five. We're sticking to the heart of the game. So I think it's interesting that they've decided to go that path mm -hmm. in their production. Yeah, and I mean, I think that the nice thing about this, and maybe this is just a smaller company that doesn't feel the need to dress this up as much. Um, but the, uh, the senior game designer who seems to be in charge of, uh, Black Flag is Celeste Conowich. And rather than doing some fancy, you know, high production value YouTube discussion style interview or anything like that, that seems to be present with most of the releases for the UA for one D and D, she just basically did like a, like a diary, you know, wrote out a page on the website. And I think the conciseness and the ease in which it was able to kind of go through those different bullet points made it so much um, faster to kind of and much clearer to understand exactly what they're trying to do as opposed to trying to weed through these longer videos that you know almost 
I mean, they go on for 20 plus minutes and, you know, while that's great to kind of do that, I mean, I've read through this article in just a few minutes and I, I had a greater understanding of what Black Flag was trying to accomplish with this. And I don't necessarily feel I was able to get that same sense of understanding just from the, the meager materials that they put out before the one D&D play test or after listening to most of those videos. I feel like kind of you get lost in the sauce a little bit. And while you, they're definitely sharing their excitement, you, you don't necessarily feel like you've learned anything over the course of it other than maybe a few key points. But I thought that was interesting. I, you know, I kind of got the same feeling you did, Mike. It, it, it does feel like they're trying to build the buzz or maintain the buzz rather than give me a ton of meaningful information. Like I, I'm not saying there wasn't any information, but given the... Uh, Given the amount of time it, I had to invest to learn what I learned, um, I, you know, it looked nice. I was, it was fine. I don't, I don't have a, a criticism other than I, it, it felt like one of those meetings that could have been an email. How about that? <laughs> I think one of the things that they have, um, one of the advantages that Cobalt Press has in their releases and coming across as more honest is just that they've seen how it can be mishandled. Um, and so I think keeping it simple and keeping it pretty straightforward instead of trying to make more bells and whistles is kind of the, the direction that they, they went. Um, and so I think that's interesting. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, it was one, what, 15-page document, not even 15 pages, like 10-page uh, document on the play, play test. So there wasn't much, much to put out there. So I think it's going to be pretty simple. But I think it was, I think it was smart. I think it was a smart decision. And, and like you said, it probably should have been done ahead of time just so people could be like, hey, this is our vision. Um and then start releasing the the stuff so people can start playtesting it, I think. And and you never know. They might have had some sort of design diary somewhere that announced it, and it, we just kind of went under our radar or something like that. But needless to say, the fact that they, they put it out after the fact means that they were responding to some of the – either the comments that they were getting, either through the form that they were had set up, or through just comments either through Reddit or anything along those lines. Because, I, again, I, I don't feel like people like – I don't feel like people – were necessarily like, oh, this is a poor game design. I think there were a lot of people that were there, there, but a lot of, you know, they were saying, oh, this is good. But then there were a lot of people in that camp that were kind of under the, why even do this game if all you're going to do is kind of be the stalwart defender of how five, fifth edition plays today. What's the point of, you know, what's the point of digging in and, and really honing in on that? And I think that, um, you know, when you, when you read what she said, um, I assume it, She's a C, I guess. Uh, Celeste said, she basically said, you know, 5th edition is her best version of the game that she's played, and she really wants to kind of keep that for posterity, but still make it better rather than make something different. And she doesn't believe that one D&D is going to accomplish that mission. Well, you know, look, I mean, looking back historically, a lot of what they're doing kind of feels like what Pathfinder did. You know, we went from 3.5 to 4. And... Obviously, there were some of the same criticisms that came out at that time, and obviously, history has shown that Paizo, you know, maybe knew what they were doing <laughs> because they're still here and 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 you know making a, a a pretty good pretty good product. Well, so and so, I guess in terms of like what they had to say as part of the design diary, I feel like it was a good step in the right direction. And if anybody from Cobalt Press even stumbles upon our feedback, um, we appreciate it. I, I feel like, you know, it, what the, the I'm in the boat where they didn't give us enough to really be truly excited about the, uh, the game, but it did give us an understanding of what they're trying to accomplish. And I do feel like, you know, with as simple of a system that D&D is, the fact that it's like one gajillion pages of content... I would really feel like if they made the rules easier to read and understand, if they accomplished that goal by itself, and <laughs> they, they, I think they would win over some hearts and minds of those people that are going to kind of stay with this this edition as opposed to maybe move to one D and D and whatever that turns into. Yeah, I agree. So I guess uh, in kind of working sequentially, I think that probably the uh, the next good step would would really be to talk about Matt Colville and his announcement from today. It's not a surprise announcement. Anybody that really pays attention to Matt Colville and MCDM and all that kind of stuff knew that they were working on a game. Cause I mean, he basically said so in last, last year when they were talking about doing it, but it was really just more of like, you know, pie in the sky kind of discussions and all those kind of things. It really wasn't a, a serious project, but it sounds like they put the, the pedal to the metal in their, uh, 
starting to really dig in and, and identify what they're doing, but they're taking and doing something entirely different. So as opposed to Cobalt Press, they're designing from the ground up. Does that excite you guys to hear that this is going to be kind of a whole new take on the epic fantasy uh, genre with uh, cinematic and action-packed play? I, I'm certainly excited. I, I think that a certain amount of disruption is needed. We've fantasy role playing right now is kind of crunchy and not, not saying it's not going to be some crunch and I don't mind crunch. I, I like chucking dice as I, as I've said before, but I, I, I think that there's room for something that feels a little more dynamic and a little more dramatic. One of, one of the, one of the things that I think, you know, the criticisms that have come across, you know, even with fifth edition, even though it improved on fourth editions, feeling of sameness is that there's still a feeling of sameness in a lot of the encounters, or at least there is to me as a player. Um, and if somebody can create a new system that's a, that is a little bit faster, is a little bit sleeker, is a little bit newer, uh, I I want to see what they do. I'm I'm kind of excited. Well. And I think the interesting part to me and the, the, the part that I'm honing in on is like feeling epic, right? Like I, I know that when you play fantasy role playing, you know, if you're playing a first level tutorial level in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, nobody's going to disagree, hopefully, that you don't really feel epic. You feel like you're lucky to take out the wolf that is, you know, harassing the shepherd sheep at that level. Um, but I think it'd be interesting to see if he's able to accomplish it. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting about it is um, that that he did call out exactly that, that he wants it to feel more epic, you know, scale fantasy. But I think the other thing that's nice is he's kind of avoiding that thing that I said, I mentioned last week that I was worried about a lot of different games coming out and being just 5e clones. Like, he is trying to present something new without these kind of baked in D and D ideas. Um, and I think that's important because I think one of the things that, I mean, when we started this podcast, one of the things that I always said is there's other games that you should maybe play that aren't D and D, especially if you're planning on playing something else. So yeah. I think it'll be neat if he can make it work to have an alternative for the D and D style game, because I think, I think I think the industry could use it. Is this game ever going to be as big as D and D? But I don't probably not. But but it'll be nice to have that alternative. Yeah, and I and I have to say that you know in terms of like epic fantasy games, I think that list is getting a lot shorter as you know kind of the narrative, you know rules rules lighter games tend to be flourishing at this point. But I, I guess time will tell. Obviously, he's been very successful with his Kickstarter and and all that kind of stuff, but... I think a dose of epic is kind of needed because nobody wants to roleplay a continuing series of starving farmers who die during the first encounter over and over and over again. I, I agree. I think that, you know, we've all been there. We've been level one. And somehow, in spite of all the setbacks we've had at that low level, we've proceeded to higher and higher levels, and we actually felt that progression. And I, and I think that some of those rules light games just don't really scratch that itch as well. So um, those of you that are interested in Matt Colville's game, uh, you know, I'd, I'm not going to be the guy that wants to necessarily advertise everything about it because I don't know anything, and I can't say if it's going to be a good or bad game. But he is doing an interesting kind of like – you know, he the, he's definitely the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain with his team, and they've decided that they're going to pull back the curtain. So if you are interested in game design, which, I mean, I agree with him that, you know, most people that run games, most people that play games, especially if you get into this hobby really, you know, really heavily, you know, you'll actually end up thinking it almost in a game designer mindset. You can see exactly how him and his team are putting this together. So as a patron, you apparently get the unfiltered version, which could be in itself very interesting but if you're just want to watch the youtube video they're going to put out a new designing the game series which i think is uh but i think it'll be very interesting for people to kind of get some insights as to how him and his team really promulgate some of these issues of creating a game from the ground up so all right 
And so uh, I guess that leaves the last of the play tests uh, that is currently going on that we're aware of. Now, obviously, there probably could be other play tests out there, but these are just some of the bigger ones. Um, 1D&D continues to, to forge ahead. Um, as we said kind of in the beginning of the episode, the 1D&D, or the, I guess the D&D team, um, had kind of a pause in there. And for those people that were paying attention to that that space, realized that it was because maybe their house was on fire and they were being called out on every channel that they possibly could. Um, but yeah, so we'll talk a little bit about this one D and D play test and kind of where it's at right now. Obviously they really took a break so they could murder the Ardlings and erase, erase them all from our memory. I think that's probably what they took the break for is to clean up that mess. You don't think they're just saving the Ardlings for the big DLC. It's the big splash. Down the road? Uh, beings, he said, maybe someday <laughs> off in the future because we love them. Okay. Uh, okay. And the video, uh, I feel like they've been put out to pasture a little bit. <laughs> okay, and so those people that may not ex- exactly be following what we're, we're talking about here, but if you have been following the 1D&D playtest, uh, I think it's Jeremy Crawford, he had mentioned that one of the, the casualties of the changes and adjustments that they're making to the rules is that the Ardlings are no longer going to be in the player's handbook. So, I mean, I don't feel like, I don't feel that necessarily takes the, the race out of the picture entirely because it, it almost like they feel like they're really attached to this race for some reason. Like somebody really thought that this was the, the coolest new thing that they could add to the the rule set. There's a ton of fan art out there, Mike, you should, you should look. <laughs> it's a lot of art link fan art. Uh, we, did, we just 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 throwing this out there. We did look for for art link fan art. We did not find the the propensity that he said in the video. Uh, but one thing I was gonna say is, of course he's gonna say they love it. Like it was someone's idea. Like mm-hmm. somebody was like, we need a race of animal headed people, and then somebody else in the room went, well, people. <laughs> Well, what's what about minotaurs? Now fuck those guys. Uh, well, what about the cat people we already have? Now fuck those guys too. They need to be celestial animal-headed things. And then somebody was like, "I love this idea. Let's do it." <laughs> so, of course, what are they going to say? Well, and it, it's actually interesting because I do have to say that they they did choose a reason to back them out of the the play test. That was that I felt was one of the critiques of them as well. Is I, I, if you guys recall, one of the things that he mentioned was that people were like, "Where the fuck did these guys come from? What is exactly. like, what is the like? We've had how many years of D and D, and there's not been a single mention of the Ardlings or why they exist, and now all of a sudden they're a main playable race? Question mark. Am I completely crazy, or do I remember some book, maybe third edition? That had Ardlings as a non-playable race. There's so many celestial races that you couldn't play. I, but I mean, are Ardlings that new? And I'm conflating two different things together. I'm pretty sure they're pretty new because it's not a name that I recognize. Okay. okay. Um, but maybe if it was, it was like it would have been in Planescape or something like that, probably. But they're they're touting it as fairly like fa- okay. a fairly new idea too. So. I'm um, I'm mixing stuff up then. That's fine. I I, but, but, I do that. But that was but but that was another problem that they talked about is this is so similar to forty other things in D and D currently. Why do we need another celestial inspired animal type thing? Um, so I think it was I think whatever the reason, I think it was probably a good choice. Um, yeah. However, I will throw out there that I do hate Goliaths and I'm sad that they're back. And yeah. that is uh, my opinion. You mean half giants? Yeah, exactly. And that's why I hate them is because they tried to tell me in fourth edition that all of my half giants, my beloved half giants from Dark Sun, were Goliaths, and that's bullshit. <laughs> well, I, I mean, and I was about to say that you you have a real reason for hating the Goliaths, and <laughs> and I feel like I, I feel like that's a valid criticism. Um, but I think that uh, one of the things that I saw on um, oh, what was it? I think it was. Uh, I think it was Bob, the world builders interview with the, the executive producer, Kyle. Um, he had mentioned that dark sun is not happening ever again. 
So I don't oh, know no. if you wanted like I don't know if you want a definitive like this is like because there's always speculation that there's a sliver of hope. I think based on his response, it was like that sliver just shut the door on that. You could you can homebrew whatever you want about Dark Sun, but there's never going to be an official support for it going forward. Based on that other little faux pas that they got so much stuff from the what were they called? The Hadozi. Yeah, the Hadozi. Based on the Hadozi uh, incident. Uh, I don't, yeah, I think that was probably the nail in the coffin for that. Yeah. So, so I guess while I would say that, you know, it's easy and I, and I don't really want to say that we're shooting on the D and D one team because I honestly, they are putting together, you know, the, the next phase of D and D and they're working hard. And I'm sure that the people that work on this team are fairly passionate about the project. They would have to be. Um, you know, and so I, I don't think that that's, it's not fair for us to a hundred percent say that they're doing terrible work but what i can say is that the the play test is continuing to proceed um they they seem to be kind of going back and forth as to what the best next steps are and the cynic in me you know is saying that we're not getting a lot of feedback on the previous like classes and stuff like that is either because there's too much feedback or as one of the things that was revealed by the whistleblowers within D beyond or whatever team that was saying that they hadn't really read it um, I guess now they have to prove to us that they read those comments. And so there's going to be a, a class specific, you know, feedback session that they, they host at some point. But I do feel like the, um, the play test packet, they did make it more robust. They actually brought out paladins and druids this time. So you, you have all of the, the divine classes that are, that are now published. And I think going forward, they're going to make it a little bit more robust each release so that it's not such a drip feed. Um, and I haven't had time to read through the, the new divine classes they put out. So it's, I can't really honestly give one way or the other, uh, but I'm still going to read it. I'll probably take a look at it this week. And if anything stands out, I'll say something next week. Uh, one of the things that I think was interesting in the little video that they put out was, uh, they did say, I can't remember exactly how he put it, but he said, we're a lot more interested in the people that leave comments. Did you, do you remember hearing that? And I thought that was funny. Because I was like, well, then what's with the other bullshit in your in your in your in your 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 survey? Like, why are you doing it then? (laughs) Well, it's I mean, it's it's a little bit of a confusing process because, you know, having worked in corporate worlds like we have, you know, we've you know, we've all experienced like how do you do satisfaction surveys and all these kind of things. And I I mean, it sounds like they're basically looking for some sort of temperature read on some of this stuff. And they're they're really only getting the highest, most, you know. Uh, the, the hottest flames and the coldest colds. But then now that he mentioned like the comments and everything like that, I mean, I, I think that's the first time he had mentioned people's comments being like, well, I gave it a, I gave it a five, but they're like, it's playable. I mean, that's no surprise to anybody that does any of this stuff. And this is why these satisfaction things can be so difficult is because he may not truly be measuring sentiment towards these things. He may be measuring, you know, people that are just either a promoter and just putting fives because they're just, you know, tired of filling out a 4,000 question survey in order to submit it. Yeah. I, I actually appreciated that they are trying to understand some of the context by reading mm-hmm. the comments, because I think that's important. Um, I also kind of honed in on the statement uh, and don't, you know, get upset if I, if I say this wrong, but things that were good enough in the past may not be good enough today like we're not looking to be the same we're looking to be better so that that gives me some hope i i do understand that you know in corporate speak and and let's not pretend that hasbro isn't a very large corporation um that may uh, may all just be you know listen to my words and don't look at what the man's doing over here behind the curtain but it does give me some hope i I believe the people that work on the teams want to produce a great product. I, I, I really do. I, I, there's no other reason to do that job because it's a lot of hours and a lot of thankless work. So I, I do have some hope, you know, from the video. I trust the people that are, that are making the production, but like in all corporate environments, I don't know about the people that are funding the projects um but one thing i would say is uh i do think i also did kind of key on the cynic and me keyed on the fact that talking about the comments seemed a good thing to say 
when your feedback was is no one's reading these things. So it is a good thing to call out and be like, oh, we really want to read these comments because we're reading them for sure. You need to recognize that we're reading these. Well, so but that's the cynic in me. Yeah. And and I don't disagree with what you're saying at all, Brent. I really <laughs> feel like, you know, there's there's it, it, there's enough awareness and as I said, they're trying to rehabilitate their rehabilitate their image in a way that, you know, it gets them back to the the place that they were. Because what's funny is is if they would have just like if there wouldn't have been this OGL drama that happened between December and January or whatever it was, would be no worries. Like people would obviously be speculating how they're going to monetize and they're going to still listen to those quarterly financial calls to go, what do you mean they want to make video game money off of role players? How's that going to work? You know, you'd still have those kind of questions that have bubbled up, but you would, you basically wouldn't have, you know, the people at, at Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro with a knife in the back of the third party creators going, ha ha, gotcha. Uh, and then trying to go, whoops, what did we just do? <laughs> You know, and trying to backpedal from that. So, I mean, I wish the people on the D&D team a lot of luck because obviously, you know, the hard part about this is, is that, you know, they're beholden to shareholders. And so it it definitely changes how they market and present their game when when their audience isn't 100 percent us, the players like, you know, there's definitely somebody that's that at the very top that says, if it's not making money, why are we not? Why are we doing it? Right. right. So. Yeah, which is which is which is something that is kind of foreign in the game, gaming community because most of the people that produce content, they don't necessarily always produce content from from the idea that they're going to make a lot of money. They produce content because they love the hobby. Um, like if you listen to most third party party creators and stuff like that, they hope they can, um, but that isn't usually their first go. So, yeah, uh, it's a, we are part of a small but passionate fan base and that includes the people that are producing the content as well in a lot of cases perhaps even some of the people producing content at hasbro wizards of the coast um you know so i'm 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 holding out hope (laughs) i'm trying i'm trying to stuff down the constant cynic in me because i i do have a a long history with D&D. I, I I can't tell you that it's my favorite game anymore, but for a lot for a lot of my life it was my favorite role playing game. Um, but you know, times change, your tastes change, your exposure to new and interesting systems and mechanics change. Uh, but yeah, I, I I I think that the hobby as a whole is healthier when two things exist: when there's a strong D and D product, and there are at least one strong competitor for those same dollars, because I think it ups everybody's game. Well, and I also think um, two things to say about that. I think one, I'm sure that one D and D will be a good game. Like I am sure it will be a good D and D game, but it will continue to be a D and D game, which that's what they want. And that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm pretty positive And I trust that they will, they will do that. Whether or not Hasbro, um, ruins the community about D D. that's that's the thing that i worry about but i think the game itself will be good um so in terms of like and, and i think you guys are absolutely right especially with the community because what if what we do know is any indicator is that people will put up with a lot of shit from companies and still consume the product and as we also probably can guess most of the people that play D D, because you know it's millions and millions probably have zero concept of some of the stuff that we're talking about because it just, it never went across the radar because they just don't stay in this space and live and breathe in this space. They may watch the the random video here or there, but they have a job, they have a life, they have kids, family, other responsibilities, and this is kind of their escapism. So they buy the book, they go play with their friend. They don't even use the adventures published by any third-party content creator or anything like that, so they have zero need. Um, so there's, there's definitely going to be people that play it, but then there's also going to be that group of people that play it in spite of knowing this, you know, just because it's the game they know, the game they love, their memory, you know, time heals all wounds kind of thing. And I, I'll probably play fifth edition and I'll probably play one D and D because I just like, I like D and D. I played it a long time. Well, I like D and D. Well, yeah. Nostalgia is a thing, right? Like mm-hmm. one of the reasons that you go back to it sometimes is you, is you like that comfortable feeling of 
Dungeons and Dragons. Like you like Kryn, you like uh, Faerun, you like Dark Sun, which is now dead apparently. Um, you like Spelljammer. Um, you know, you like all that stuff. And so, you know, you like Spelljammer and it's no space combat rules. Um, but you, uh, you, you know, you like doing those things. And so, yeah, it's nice to return to them sometimes. So I think, uh, I think we can neatly segue into our next segment, um, which was going to be solo role-playing. Uh, because, you know, playing games, you know, the, the one thing that's really interesting about this, this hobby, the tabletop role-playing hobby, is that people play in groups. And it, it really is a great way to socialize, build friends, and have just some wonderful shared experiences. But there is definitely a group of, uh, you know, a group of games as well as a play style that you can kind of do on your own. Because everybody's been there at least once where, you know, you're getting ready for your game night. You're so excited. You're going to hop on Discord. You're going to hop into Roll20, whatever it is. And someone goes, oh, last minute cancellation. And then, you know, you deflate because maybe that was your game master and now you guys don't have a game. And then the other people just kind of go, oh, well, no gaming. And then as soon as they hear that message, they just evaporate. No longer able to be contacted kind of thing. Or you go, okay, well, when's our next session? You know, because we want to play weekly or bi-weekly or something like that. And then everyone gets out their calendars and there's conflicts the like that you've never seen. And so the next session is several months away. And that's just, I mean, that's not sustainable for a gaming group. So that's where solo RPGs come into play. Basically, you choosing a system, and some systems are actually designed with solo play in mind, or applying a rule set to help you play the game, but you basically play the game on your own. You do the the part of the player, and you kind of collaborate the part of the GM, depending on the type of play that you do, and you actually can enjoy your own set of adventures. Many can be challenging, they can be fun, they can be interesting, and they can be unexpected and surprising. So they don't you won't necessarily see how the game unfolds because some of that work that's being done on the GM side is actually kind of random and different than you'd expect. So where do you guys want to start with solo role-playing? Uh, well, we can talk a little bit about the Pathfinder adventure. Um, okay. One of the things that we did um, kind of as a group for this is we kind of um, Pathfinder in their starter box. Is that right? Yep, the the starter box. Uh, Pathfinder and the starter box put out a kind of solo adventure that you could play with the idea of just kind of familiarizing yourself with the rules. And um, it was interesting uh, as I played through it. Um, I will say that. Um, so first things first, and in terms of just, you know, what it was, is it was very much a choose your own adventure game. So before anybody gets the wrong idea about this, it was not like an Oracle or journaling style game. It was a, it was, it was a very structured choose your own adventure game. But I guess one question I have for you, Brent, and you too, Jeff, is that did you feel that at the end of the Pathfire game, you had a better sense of how the game played out of curiosity? Well, considering that, 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 that it's kind of purpose-built for somebody who hasn't really played to get an idea of the types of things that you have to do in encounters, from that perspective, when I finished it, it left me wanting more, which I th- think is what you want an introduction to do. Okay. Um, personally, um, I, I also discovered you know a few things as myself. I'm... In a choose-your-own-adventure setting, and I don't have something compelling me to do stuff, I'm a horrific completionist. So I, I can't stand that I skipped sections and didn't go back. So I went back. I had to. I, I, I survived. I did not die. I, I was close. <laughs> but I managed to live. Um, I'm not great with the choose-your-own-adventure thing personally, but I thought for what they were doing, I thought it was effective. Brent, what was your experience? Uh, no, I uh, I did die, for the record. Uh, I got critted on twice by the statue, um, uh, which could only happen to me. Um, as far as like learning anything, I've played a lot of role-playing games, so I would say it didn't teach me anything different about Pathfinder that I didn't already know from 5th edition. Um, and I think I'm the... Uh, in this group, I think I'm the... 
least interested in solo play games um just because the social aspect is a big part of the game for me um so it was kind of it was it was kind of interesting to sit down and and watch my bad choices unfold um in just by myself that was kind of interesting but it wasn't that the the pathfinder one shot was would be good for somebody who's never played before i think um just to kind of give them an idea of what what like you know a turn is what dice they're rolling what number they're trying to hit and stuff like that but for me it was it was it was pretty lackluster. I did think it was funny that I died during the adventure, um, but uh, but yeah, it was it was interesting. But I don't think it was anything. It it wasn't that compelling to me. Um, and I have the same problem: is if I'm involved in a story like a choose your own adventure story or something like that, I have a ten- tendency to do the same thing. I will go back and be like, oh well, what was the other choice? Um, and so those are kind of. Those are kind of unsatisfying to me. It would probably be better if it was more random. Yeah. So, and I think you bring up a good point because I I do have to say that, you know, I think that every one of us here has some capability as a metagamer, right? We have the ability to recognize clues that we missed or, or, you know, kind of apply tropes and, and maybe see the writing on the wall. Now, obviously, as we went through this, you know, you're like, oh, and, and I think we're doing a spoiler-free review. I don't think we've actually given away anything other than fought a statue, right? Um, you know, you you basically are saying, like, oh, you, you're basically choosing binary, like, A or B. And, you know, anybody that's done a choose-your-own-adventure book, or what's been really interesting is the fact that, like, Netflix, like, went really deep into these interactive things. And I don't think to the best of success. Now, I... I mean, just as a short aside, like I, I apparently re-traumatized Brent because there was something called like Escape the Undertaker's Mansion on that. And me and my wife were going to play that as part of some like Halloween type deal last year or something. I think we maybe got about 10 minutes in before we said, what the fuck is this? And then we. T- <laughs> it's pretty However, it's it's pretty hilarious. Uh, like, I think everybody should play through it just because it's pretty funny because like it's wrestlers acting like wrestlers. Except acting, um, it's Except very the Undertaker, weird. who's apparently the immortal Undertaker with all kinds of weird artifact. Well, yeah, but that's like his. That's like his. That's like his wrestling character too. Like, I know they used to bring an urn. They used to bring an urn to the ring and like resurrect him with the urn. So, um, like, eh. but like it's just weird because like it's like I don't know. There's things that work in wrestling that don't translate well to any other form of media and this is probably one of them and the fact that it was like choose your own adventure was even stranger like it was yeah. like um it was an entertaining 15 minutes i will say that um of of like acid trip quality of like what the f- is going on sort of uh sort yeah. of thing did did you see that so they they actually i think netflix they started with uh black mirror they had a uh, black mirror thing that was interactive that really blew people's mind because I guess it was very well done. I hadn't actually played it. It's supposed um, to be. I have not played it either. But I think the, there's. Uh, I, I think the other ones were uh, there's some Bear Giles like, can you survive yeah. the wilderness ones? Um, <laughs> like, and I was oh, like, bear. I was like, no, uh, uh-uh. uh, no. But in, it's a smart. It was a smart choice. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I think that having those survival type shows would be uh, it would be right for that type of thing. Now, admittedly, like as soon as I saw those ones, I was like, I have no interest in in playing through those. Unfortunately, yeah. So, I, I think the one advantage to the video system is that it there is something like in a video game that forces me to live with my choice. That whole completionist part of my brain that wants to go back and see what happens if I go down the other branch or do something else, um, the system, you know, forces me to do stuff. The wrestling, the wrestling one, you can actually go back and take the other choices and actually let you do that. So you're wrong. Um, in the, in oh, okay. that case, it was, it was I'm like, wrong. Oh, I can see, I can see how all of them do this. I have to do this. Cause now my brain is damaged and I have to see what's going on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whereas, whereas me and my wife like started doing this, our jaws hit the floor as to how silly and stupid it was. And then we just kind of like said, well, what else can we watch? And we must have watched something like Alien or some other horror themed movie or something like that. But uh, like, anything, like anything with wrestling, it's pretty dumb. Um, like as someone who enjoys wrestling once in a while, it's pretty dumb. 
Um, and it's dumb on a on a higher scale just because it's there's a lot of acting in it that's bad. So yeah. So so getting away from the the choose your own adventure style, there are other styles of um of games. And I think that the one is that uh you know, like I, I've I've seen that some solo RPGs are done through a series of journaling and stuff like that. Um and it, I think it's still it, there's still systems that allow you to add something to this because because what you what I don't think that you don't want to you want to do in these solo RPGs is your goal isn't to create like a free form writing exercise where you just are now creatively writing a story that you want to do because the most important element of these solo RPGs is that there's a rule set that you bound yourself to in order to progress the story or surprise yourself or do whatever it may be. Um, so journaling is one of them that I've seen a little bit about. And of course, uh, the other one is kind of the, um, that like Oracle or Oracle design and all those kind of things. And I think journaling can have that as well, but it basically is just like, I enter a room is the bar packed. Oh, it is not packed. And you know, so you don't actually know how the story is going to unfold because you're using a, a, a game master emulator and there's actually systems that are designed with a Game Master emulator in, in purpose, like Mythic is actually a really well-regarded one. And so you can pick up that book and actually have a way for you to, to I don't know, surrender some of that stuff to dices and all those kind of things. But there are also tables, you know, so it's not just as simple as like saying, I go into a bar, is it packed? Yes or no? Sometimes it might be, it's very closely aligned with what you're asking. It's not very closely aligned. It kind of deviates in different directions and all those things. So I think it has very interesting components to it. And I think, you know, what it, what I think I understand is that for Brent and Jeff, the choose your own adventure style of game is probably their least exciting one because it's just like, well, I went down the cave. There was a crack I didn't go down. I got to go down to that crack now and see what happens. <laughs> you know, something like that. But uh, I guess in terms of, um, in terms of like play styles and everything like that, for a, an actual game that's purpose built around it is uh, Iron Sword. Is that correct, Brent? Was that the one you said? That Iron, Iron Sword Sworn is the one that I yeah I believe that is designed at least in big part for solo or GMless play. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't look into it very heavily. I just remembered it was one that was kind of talked about when I was looking at different RPG reviews. Um, yeah. So before we get to that, I do have I have a question I would ask um, just kind of the group in general is what would motivate you potentially to play a solo game versus something else? Um, like what would make you play a solo role playing game instead of picking up a video game console? Uh, well, I would have to say there's there's probably two reasons that um, I would probably pick up a, a solo game is that one I, I was in a situation where I couldn't play a video game. I know that seems less and less, but you can solo role play with minimal, minimal equipment anywhere you are. I mean, sometimes, sometimes all you need is a dice and piece of paper. If that you could use a deck of playing cards. I mean, there's many ways to actually conduct solo role playing and not to say that this is something you should do, but I, I have read stories of people in like call centers where the call center has very strict requirements on what you can have out at your desk and everything like that. And you could literally game with pencils and dice and a notepad if you're in between calls and all those kind of things. So there may be a situation in which that happens. Um, I have it nowadays with how ubiquitous technology is. I don't think that's going to come up as much there. Uh, but the second reason, and then probably the more likely reason, and this is something I do, it's kind of my simulationist approach to understanding my own rule system, is that rather than necessarily quote unquote, do full solo role playing is that I test rules. And, you know, when you, when you play test rules, because you don't understand how they work, like for me, I had to understand how Basin worked, you know, cause I, I was introducing the game to you guys. And so it helped me to kind of devise scenarios in which certain kind of actions and activities would happen to help reinforce how the rules would play out and basically create questions that I asked myself to say, okay, well, why, what do I need to understand about this better to be able to explain to my players that this is how the game mechanics work and everything like that. Um, so those are the kind of the two reasons that I would most commonly play a solo role playing game. I can see what you're saying, Brent video games in a lot of ways have replaced that solo time that you spend doing that. Although it feels like now a lot more video games require you to play with other players, you know, on a live server to do stuff, to, to get the most out of it. But I, 
I th- I think my answer is kind of a, a cop. I'd be willing to try a solo role playing game, and if the system was robust enough to interest me, I would be interested in in exploring more. I was the kid in grade school who would buy new modules when they came out for D and D and play them by myself. Like I was GM. I was one or two or three characters. If if there was a way for me to get that that experience back and and interact with content that I found engaging, I think that would be kind of awesome. And it might stop me from watching a video or playing a video game or reading a book or sitting there scrolling endlessly on my goddamn phone. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it would be neat. Um, so I, I, I can imagine in any of those settings where I would do any of those other things. But for me, the 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 system needs to be compelling and easy enough to use for me to want to come back to it. I think what you mentioned there was actually interesting because the one, the one comment about video games is I think like, so my brain is broken because I played world of Warcraft and I still continue to play world of Warcraft off and on. And when you, when you find the gameplay loop for world of Warcraft, it's highly repetitive, not necessarily very creative, but you know, you every so, so often you may find lore or other little tidbits that, keep you interested in the game and everything like that. But what I think you realize very quickly about video games is that, you know, there is a, there's not infinite replayability with most games. And I know that when I say that there's not infinite replayability, that don't get me wrong. I've stared at a a Stellaris map um, for hours. I think I have several hundred hours of that in, in my in my brain somewhere, you know, about how much I played it and all that kind of stuff. So you can still play video games for a ton of time. But in most cases, you play video games and it's, what, 10 hours of a story that you play through, 15 hours of a story that you play through for, you know, 60, 70 bucks. And then, you know, there may be some side quests that you do. Whereas a solo game, I think the potential to tell an interesting, engaging, and fun, unique story is, um, you know, it exists. Like, you know, I, you you could tell a story that would be so, it, you know, so funny that, you know, you're like, oh, this is, a, this is the most amazing thing. And this is the one thing that I kind of am, I'm laughing about on the inside is that like solo role playing as interesting as it sounds in some ways. I mean, I hate to say this, but do you feel like a social outcast or what? Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, at least when you play role playing as a group, you know, you're like, oh, you play role playing with your friends. Oh, OK. One of those weird guys that plays role playing. And this might be just me, my upbringing. But then if you like take and make that solo where you just kind of go off on your own and you're lapping your own jokes and all that stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> No, and I guess that that was that that's kind of the point that I I I guess that's one of the things that I'm getting to. Like for me, I, it would be very hard because the social aspect is so important to me and one of the reasons that I enjoy video games is because there's even though like even if I don't play a game with other people, like there's still this sense of community that I get. Like I can still go and like see other people playing the game. I can look at other people's builds. I can see there are other people. So the only real way, like, and I guess this is another problem that I have um, with like when I was trying to be a writer, like a lot, a big part of writing is just writing for yourself and trying to like collect things that are maybe someday good enough to try and get somebody to publish. And like, one of the things that I struggle with is I have a hard time writing a story without a sense of it being shared with someone. And so for me, the idea of a solo role-playing game where I'm telling myself a story with no one to share it with is very difficult. Even if it's a even if it's a quality story and I enjoy it, it seems just so fleeting to me. Um, mm-hmm. And that's and that's kind of where where some of my like where my interest kind of dies is like if we sat down like the three of us and were like we're gonna play a solo role-playing game for a week and then we got together and like discuss it like i could see that being something that i would i would do but at that point why are we just not playing a game together together um you know yeah so that that's kind of why like like i can get like edge cases of reasons that why you would do it like like you, like you said, game testing. Like I consider game testing not really solo role playing because you're really doing it to prep for something you're going to do with somebody else. Like in my mm-hmm. opinion, solo role playing is you sit down and you tell yourself a story with randomness where you don't know what's going to happen, and I just don't feel like that's as fulfilling as say as like reading a book to me. So yeah. I really, str- I really struggle with the concept. 
personally. Yeah. Um, well, but to bring it back, Brent, I mean, the reason why we don't get together, all three of us, is because we don't have schedules that line up, obviously. <laughs> um, but again, we play I, every would game ra- <laughs> I would rather read the book, is what I'm saying. Like, I'd rather read that story instead of... I don't know. It just it's it's a very it's a very interesting thing for me. And but maybe psychologically I just it's 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 a it's a, it's a tough sell for me. Um well, they're very interesting. So. No, it is it is interesting, but I I think all of us for the most part have that that shared storytelling thing to to borrow your term Brent. I think we all very much grew up playing these games for the most part and enjoying them because of the people that we played with, because of the things that happened and the, and, and the times that we shared. And so I, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm going to rush out and try all the solo role playing. If solo role playing interests you though, there is an amazing amount. Like I expected to find four options when I started doing research and there was a lot more. So if it is something that interests a person, there is a ton of content out there. And I have to believe that you're going to find something that resonates with you. Um, and so if you, you know, if you have one of those crappy schedules that doesn't line up with any of your friends, maybe you can still get some gaming goodness, you know, out of your week. And man, I spent so much time in front of a screen, a computer screen, a television screen, my goddamn phone that <laughs> maybe i'd be a little 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 less uh you know however it is that i am if i spent more time in front of paper or in front you know with my own imagination um so i i can kind of see it even though I, I i might be more in brent's camp where i don't know that i'm actually going to seek it out well and i think that you know it's one of those things where you know i i think if you game or the right methodology to it you might you might find that it's very interesting and it and of course with this you know if you want uh like if if you enjoy the act of writing you might find tangential likes to what you're doing anyway especially if you t- take like a journaling approach and all that kind of stuff and and we're not saying that solo gaming is for everyone uh because there are definitely as as brent mentioned there are personality types did you guys ever hear about the uh, bartle taxonomy of players you guys ever heard of that term I think I've heard of it. I think I've yeah. heard of it. I, I, if I looked at it, I I, don't, it's not jumping out at me. <laughs> I don't well, remember it. So, so what's interesting is that one of the one of the advice uh, columns or things that I was looking at was actually saying, you know, in order to have the most fulfilling solo game, to undersell understand yourself as a player and what you find enjoyable, and it basically kind of tried to use this Bartle tax Bartle taxonomy of player types as a way to better define your goals and objectives in your game, so that you could, you know, say like, hey, this is how this could work. And what they suggested is there's really there's really you know the three of the four types can do solo solo role playing uh, pretty well you know and so one is called the achievers they're the diamonds and they're the people that prefer like to gain points so like your solo role playing could be about how you grow a character from first to 20th level in D&D or something like that and so that's that's a very tangible very appealing goal for some people you have some people that are explorers and so you know there's the the dungeon delve type solo role playing games where they can go in they can dive through the dungeon and they can get all the treasure and do all that kind of stuff and find new things and all those that could be very appealing to some but there is one that's called the socializer and so when you look at like that type of personality type that doesn't necessarily fit into this solo role play uh type because part of the reason why you're there is to be with the other people. You don't care that you necessarily slayed the dragon, but you care that you had an experience with the other four people at the table and everything like that. So you may not necessarily find it as fulfilling a style of game than the other three types. And the last type, of course, is the killer. Um, They're the ones that want to either beat other players and or power gaming or, you know, power consumption. I don't know. You know, they're they're like, they have their own reasons too, but I was going to leave them off. So. Hey Mike, I, I believe right. the uh, term now is not killer; it's unaliver. Is unaliver. the uh, accepted term? Oh yeah. Well, I mumble enough, maybe um, the YouTube or algorithm won't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, no, and I think I definitely fall a little bit, I definitely probably fall in that socializer category. That's probably one of the reasons I'm a GM person most of the time. Um, we have two GMs in this group, uh, consistent GMs in this group, but that's probably yeah, why I'm I have run games, them. they're just not great. <laughs> well, I you haven't run a game for us. Um, so, I mean, so I'm usually the person that tries to run the game to bring people together, so... I think that's probably a big part of it. Um, I do think there's a place for solo role, uh, solo games. I don't want anybody to think that I am against it or bagging on anybody that does solo role playing games. I think that's great. It just doesn't, it doesn't scratch an itch for me that, like, it just does. It just doesn't. Like, I, I didn't even when I was younger. Like, choose your own adventure books. Like, did not appeal to me whatsoever because it felt like an incomplete story. Um. Any time that I did choose your own adventure, so I just wanted to add that if any of our listeners have made it this far into the podcast and you have tried solo role playing games, tell us why you love them. I just leave a comment on on the video on YouTube, or let us know uh, because you might uh, get a convert, and we'll if if we get any comments, we will talk about them next week. Yeah, I would love I would love to talk to somebody who loves solo role playing and um just to find out like what what you know makes it interesting to them. I think that's I mean it's it's very interesting cuz going into a cold without knowing somebody that has it's not something that moves moves the uh moves the dial for me. So yeah. Well, needless to say, I think that when we talk about uh solo role playing you know we're obviously not the experts and don't have a ton of games under our belt for this but um, i think there may be a a part of us that gives it a try so that we can give a more accurate report out on you know the different styles of it Um, obviously jeff and i will try to experiment a little bit on this and brent will listen to how we did um (laughs) But, you know, I think we'll I think, you know, as as true to our mission, you know, we really do want to bring more games to more people and and help open up people to the vast world of, of, you know, how you role play out in the in the wild these days. So uh, with that, I think um, I think that's kind of our initial thoughts on solo gaming. You know, we're really not going to go too deep into it, but we you know gave you some basics and all that stuff and kind of shared our thoughts on what it is and all those things. More to come on that maybe later. Um, But. I think that's where we're ending for today. So, Brent, you want to send us off? Uh, Yes. Um, As always, if you made it this far in the podcast, thank you for listening. Uh, We really appreciate it. Um, Please like, subscribe, uh, do all the social media things that uh, everyone always asks everybody to do at the end of one of these. So please do that for us. And as always, please uh, be safe, roll well, and roll wise. And see.